So joining us now is Mark Bristow. He's the CEO and president of Barrett Gold. Uh, Mark, I kind of teed you up there. Uh, you are really good at being a gold miner CEO. Are you going to become a copper CEO in the future, more so? Listen, I'm good at making money out of mineral resources, and that's my job. So thank you for that. Uh, you know, it's not about whether it's copper or gold. Right now, we're, uh, we're produced copper, um, and, uh, and we have three m copper mines, two of which we operate. And, uh, and they are big copper mines, and they are pure copper mines. You know, my comment about copper is that gold, if you want to keep uh, the relevance uh, of uh, being a large cap company in the resource space, and you want to continue to replace the gold you mine, you're going to have to get your head around the, ability, the importance of copper coming with the gold because we have to move to bigger and bigger deposits, which are then uh, usually porphyry deposits, and they come with gold. And, uh, and, we, and it's the same process, very little difference in the technology. But I don't think we have to come really spend too much time on that. Uh, you know, we've built a great business in Rangold first, and now uh, the Barrick uh, Group, and, uh, and we're being able to deliver high quality returns to our shareholders at a time when uh, they need it. And, uh, and we are, uh, just to answer the, the question about, are we gonna be seduced by this gold price? The answer is definitely no. Okay, I, I've talked to you many times over the years, Mark, and, and you've always, try to play with a straight bat when it comes to the gold price and talk a little bit about making sure that you're doing it on a on a reasonable um, and sustainable kind of metric. There are people around the world shouting at the television right now saying, ask Mark where he thinks the price of gold is going. It has come up very quickly, Mark. Where do you think it's going? No, it's a good question. And, you know, what I'd say is, if you look back to 1972, uh, there have been two gold sparks, 1980 and 2011. And of course, we're busy with one now. They're all sparks. But what's important is if you look uh, post each big rise in gold price, is a new basis formed. And I'll try and explain to you why. What happens when gold prices run up like this is that the paper money is at risk. And, of course, on top of that, you get a flight to safety. So the flight to safety comes off as the global economy stabilizes. But, you know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand that all this printing of money is going to result in damage to those core global currencies. And, and the measure of that is an elevated gold price. So we're expecting the gold price to settle at a new base. We're going to see lots of volatility over the next while. It's, this is an unprecedented global event. It's going to take some time and, and certainly more time than what we saw in the uh, post-2008 uh, great global uh, financial crisis. Um, but at the end of the day, there will be a new base, and we'll wait to see what that base is. In the meantime, Sticking with 1,200 is the right thing to do. We have allocated uh, uh, our business on a 10-year plan at 1,200. We've got those ounces defined. For us to change the gold price in which we uh, allocate capital, we would take away from those margins, and we don't want to do that. There is opportunities to, uh, to take additional uh, production on the margin, outside that 10-year plan, and we are definitely looking at those opportunities going forward. But that would be my, my point. So, and we don't want to change the gold price mid-spark. Well, but, Mark, sort of bringing on incremental production because of a higher gold price, what, what do you need to see to make that decision? Because I, I've known you for a long time. I covered gold in 2011, and the one thing that always struck me about you is that you're more conservative when it comes to that kind of stuff. You don't get caught yeah. up uh, in the gold fever. So what do you need sure. to see to then go bring so that Let me on? explain to you when I say on the margin. So our 10-year plan uh, in Nevada, for instance, uh, results in us moving underground, and it releases some of the uh, um, the uh, processing capacity 
for uh, oxide ore, for instance. Some of our mills are scheduled to close down in the future, probably 18 months, two years ahead. So, so as we go underground and we, re we, we, we focus in on higher grade, more refractory ore, we use uh, more, you know, more focus on our smelters, our, our roasters, um, we release some capacity. That we can, that's the marginal capacity I'm talking about. The same with our, uh, our leach, uh, heap leach projects. We can, there's no restriction on capacity, so we can use, we can put a, a different ore onto those leach pads. And, uh, and the only other one is Tongan, which is coming to the end of its life. You would have seen we have already announced that we've got a new plan for Tongan. It could take it out another four years because although it's still allocating capital at 1200 it's a different margin because we can take uh, the higher gold price and still deliver more value than our current plan, which close, was going to close next year. So those are the sort of opportunities. We did it in 2009 in, in uh, Lulo Goncoto where we, we, we took a pit that was always marginal at our thousand dollars and suddenly it became very valuable and we mined it out in, in 18 months and it really delivered some extra revenue. So when I say on the margin, it means on top of our 10 year plan rather than replacing anything within our current plan. Mark, you said earlier on in this conversation that your, your shareholders are looking for kind of any help they can get right now. What did you mean by that? What, I, what, is, what kind of conversations are you having with your shareholders at the moment, many of which will have many, many other stocks in their portfolio? What are they saying to you about what they want from your business and what they want kind of down the road as well? So right now, I told them what I'd deliver them, and I'm sticking to that uh, story. You know, if you go back to uh, the merger with uh, with Rand Gold uh, last year, January, um, and then the subsequent transactions, it, the story has always stayed the same, and that is we want to build a, a the most valued mining company in the world. Why? Because we want people to want to work for, for us. We want uh, the country, our host countries, to want to have us in their country, and we want our shareholders to be owners rather than just traders. And, uh, and we've seen a big improvement in our general list investor across the board. And even in our, the big funds that own us, they are, they, that's not just anymore the uh, precious metal fund. It's many other generalist funds within those big institutions. And, so, and, and people invest in gold for two things. And what I wanted to do, and I've always done this my whole career, is... You create a company to be able for your shareholders to d get value. And, uh, and what I, I set out to do is to create a gold company where our shareholders could get value throughout the cycle. But in the peak of the cycle, it's, the peak is always related to a downturn in the global economy. And so you balance um, one's investment. And it's been proven now, you know, 1999, uh, further forward, we've already been through, you know, two that we, we're busy with a second significant spike where investors can benefit. And what you've seen so far in the gold industry today r relative to 2010 um, is that the, sh the equities are outperforming the gold price for the first time because there's a re renewed focus on discipline. Mm -hmm. And I hope uh, we all stay the course. Yeah. But, um, you know, that, that's what it's all about, is that our shareholders can now maximize and leverage the gold price in a time when maybe some of the other investments are not doing as well.